Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and this is the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome. Um, hey, are you shooting in manual? If not, you need to take our four weeks to proficiency in photography course. That course is going to give you a solid foundation in photography. It is an interactive course where you have a teacher, me, so you have to turn in your homework, and the homework is really, I, my belief, I mean, we really, our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical, so we teach in a very simplified way, but the homework is what really, really helps you internalize what you're learning. So that, um, look on our schedule on understandphotography.com to see when we're offering it next. It's September 7th, I think, is the next date that it's available. Um, we're also having a ladies only weekend on September 15th through the 17th in Naples, Florida, limited to just three ladies. So if you have a couple friends, you can have your own private photo workshop. It's so much fun and you are going to be stretched. We do all kinds of cool things. We also have, of course, Joe Fitzpatrick leads our Everglades tours and his four day trip is January 25th through the 28th, 2018. Don't miss that because it always sells out. And Joe's also going to be leading a trip to the Apalachicola area in April. More information coming on that. We don't have that on the website just yet. So go to understandphotography.com. Check out. We've got more online classes um, and our trips and, of course, more information about the show and things like that. So today, my guest is Brian Jansen, and Brian has been on the show before. You may remember him. And he also works here uh, when he's in town at Understand Photography because he is, first of all, he fits right in with our mission statement of simplifying the technical. He is such a good instructor. He can simplify things. He's patient with people. He's just fabulous. So when he's in town, he leads the Old Naples Photo Tour, and we're going to start giving him more work when he comes back this this coming season. <laughs> anyway, Brian's a travel and landscape photographer. He leads photo, photo workshops and tours all over the world, but mostly in Europe. Okay, so today, Brian's going to take us through the process of creating and executing one of his photo trips. So, welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Nice I'm to be here. I'm on speed talking today. <laughs> very excitable person. Yes. So, all right, let's just, let's start from the beginning. Very so, beginning. So where am I going to go? Where are you going to go? Well, let's pick a place. Uh, well, let's pick Italy because I'm going to Italy. Italy works great. Some I'm of my best right memories are from Italy. Okay. Staying right in the middle of the country. What mm -hmm. should I do? Well, uh, uh, your story is going to be significantly different than mine, I'm sure. Okay. Um, and, uh, but bring everything you can carry because there will be opportunities to use your gear in so many ways. Like every kind of gear I have? Well, yeah. that's a lot of gear. <laughs> well, okay, maybe your What's studio stuff. What's my minimum um, gear? Minimum, I would say a really good zoom with a good range. And uh, if there's a like lot... Like good zoom like my 24 7 600? Like that? Uh, not unless you're after animal photography. Okay, and I'm not. I'm a landscape kind of person. Italy's about... Gorgeous landscapes and beautiful little villages and towns. So there's a mixture of people. There's some close range things. There's plenty of far away things. Um, one of my favorite provinces is Umbria, and I, I think and that may be, be right? where you're headed. Yeah, the Monte Sibillini uh, National Park is just fabulous. Ah. And I love mountains, so that's that's like my forte. Uh, we have a blast there. So, say, um, so maybe a 24 to 105 would be a good 24 price? 105 that, that's a good walk around lens for me the okay. I think the 24 70 is a hair bigger and or better sorry a little sharper right. um, and yeah. I'm a Canon guy so I'm comparing those two um, but the 24 105 is perfect for walking through villages and and uh, just as a walk around sort of lens but okay. uh, you'll find opportunity for some wider stuff as well uh, I have a 1635. If you have a ultra I wide, a 17 to 40. Hmm, it's a nice lens. Okay. Yep. So I'll bring that. I would too. Yeah. So bring and it. Should I do the 17 to 40 and then the 24 to 70, or the 24 would, to 105? Because I'm not bringing both of those. Yeah. Then I would probably pick. If it were me, I'd pick the 24 70. But okay. you might consider. Oh, it kind of depends length, on the amount of time you have. And then, I, are you going to bring your your 70 200? 
should I? I would. Okay. <laughs> That's, I use that a lot. A lot of heavy stuff to carry. Plus yes. my laptop yes, it in is. my back. And those are three really, I think they're really good zooms and they cover a lot of range okay. and, and your picture quality is normally really good with those lenses. Um, so I'd recommend that if you can. Okay. Um, if you can't bring the 7200, then definitely bring the 24105. Okay. Because you will find time to use and that little. And tripod, of course. Absolutely. I All think. Right. So when you're putting together a photo trip, let's say you're going to mm -hmm. put together a photo trip in the Umbria or just Italy, I guess, in general. What well, do you, how, what, how do you start? Yeah, at the, the very beginning of each of my trips, and, and for a lot of people, I think, is, is inspiration. What, what is it that moves you? What, uh, why are you doing photography? And specifically, where would you like to go and do your photography at? See, well, I don't know because and, I have never been there. Oh, well, <laughs> but, you know, you see the world around you through television, through books, okay. magazines, other people's work, and, and something catches your eye quite often. And, and you say, this is partly what got me into it, was uh, seeing other people's work um, and thinking, wow, what beautiful places. I'd love to go there. Okay. So whatever it is that sparks your interest, well, I love uh, the landscapes follow the trail. And uh, uh, for me, again, a big part of my inspiration is historical things. That's one oh, reason why Europe speaks to me, the yeah. old world kind of uh, lifestyle and things like that. So. Um, as much as Milan is a fascinating city, and if you were a fashionista, Milan would probably be the place to go in, in Italy, um, that's not for me. Okay. I, I like more of, as far as cities, I'm more of a Rome, Venice, sort of, or okay. Florence. Uh, I love the artwork there. Yeah. So, well, those are three on my list for sure. Great cities to photograph, great cities to be in. Um, the pace is just wonderful. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of what the process you've gone through. Okay. What, what moves you? What do you think of when you think of Italy? Um, my photography is a bit of, of uh, city and village uh, kind of general travel life, and then also in the mountains and landscape okay. photography. So I, I do both sides. Um, and in Umbria, there's just so many good opportunities for uh, landscape work. It's just beautiful. Now, unfortunately, the, uh, some of the recent uh, earthquakes they've had okay. have taken their toll on a few of my favorite towns. Uh, and, and I think near where you're thinking of going, there's a town called Norcia, um, which, by the way, has the best. Have you heard of pasta cinghiala? Uh -uh. It's wild boar. Ooh. And it is the best tasting meal you will ever have. Okay, I, you're gonna have I to swear. Say it again. Cinghiala. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to spell it right now, but I'll find it and get it to you. Um, it's fabulous, and it's it's a local to the Umbrian area. Okay. And uh, they don't serve it. Well, they do serve it here in the U.S., but it's... Not the same. No, not, <laughs> not even close. So you have to try that. Okay. Um, but when I, I start a trip, it, it's... Uh, it's research and planning, and uh, very little of my travel and landscape photography happens by accident. Okay. I don't do a lot of walk around. I do in some of the villages during the day and whatever I can catch, I do. But most of my, uh, what I'm after is a well-planned out affair. And, and how do you do the planning? Normally, uh, I'll, I'll use tools and uh, online, there's so many tools these days to like what? even Google Earth. Uh, okay, just Google starting Earth. there. A lot of a lot of people who've been on the show have talked about Google Earth to yeah. map out a location. It's just a good place to start, okay. and and then Google Maps, which ties right into it, can get you there. If you if you got your rental car, uh, you can find places to park your car and where the trailhead starts, or if you need to hike, it, it's just a good good research tool. Google Maps will teach you that. Uh, you well, they that? they integrate together. In fact, if you're on Google Maps, you can look at it in satellite view, which shows you the right. picture, or street view, so you can see both back and forth. Okay. And uh, yeah, and you can mark. But how do you know where to go in the first place? Not through Google Earth. Well, that gets back to the inspirational part. Okay. What has caught your attention recently that you know that you want to go see? Uh, normally, there's a bit of adventure or uh, something that makes you want to go see something and experience something, and then you want to also photograph it. So, whatever that place happens to be, and um, but what if you don't know? How would you how would you research? If you don't know, well, you've heard of Italy. 
I've heard of Italy. Presumably. I don't know where to go in Italy. Uh, picture books would be a good place to start. Okay. Um, and maybe specifically to the region, that if you've already committed to an area. Google, um, maybe, or you just could, Google or search, like, go Uria, Italy, or? Yeah, and just search Pinterest? search images. Pinterest? Pinterest There's was what I did before I went to Huge collection of images, yeah. yeah. And that's a good that's way. That's how I found out about Lamar from, from Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And there's also the old-fashioned way. I used to go to Barnes and Noble and look through all the travel guides and ah. and uh, see what felt right, and just picking up little bits. Well, now I would imagine there's more photographic books out too, mm -hmm. since photography is so popular. So yes. that might be an option too. Mm -hmm. So you do. You, so you get your inspiration, and then you start doing research on, on, on where you want to go and what you're going to do, and then you map it out using Google Earth and Google Maps. Am I following you? Yes, use okay. both of those extensively. And uh, the, um, uh, you normally, for me, I map out, depending on how much time I have, if I have a month, say 30 days, I will map out maybe 20 locations. Okay. Specific locations. I know I want to be here, and, and then you start deciding what time of day you need to be there. And how do you figure that out? Again, Google Earth can help because okay. you can see the direction that you're facing to get the, the type of photograph you want. If the does it tell you where the sun's going to be, though? Google Earth does not. Okay. There are other software pieces for that. Uh, sometimes I use the photographer's ephemeris, which and is... And you said you use that on a computer? Mm-hmm. See, I, didn't, I thought it was just on the iPhone it's, or whatever. It's both. It, you can use it and on... It's confusing. I couldn't... I was like, oh, is my it? God, I don't know if I can figure this out. Well, there's probably easier ones to work uh, than that. But um, no, maybe it's easier on the computer. It works just quite that, fast for me. And that tells you what time... Like you, okay, so you want to go somewhere, pick a place in, in Italy, in Umbria? Uh, town of Prechi in the okay. Monte Sibillini National Park. So you Park. know you want to you photograph, photograph the village. The village. Mm -hmm. And so you go on this software or website or app. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you put, you put in, in the coordinates? You put in the location. Normally it has a huge database of uh, cities and towns and locations. Okay. So you can actually just put in the town and uh, it'll take you right there. And it'll center that on your screen. And then, and then you set the date that you're planning to be there. Okay. And if you don't know the exact date, then you just guess somewhere close in the range. And, uh, and honestly, the, the direction of the sunlight doesn't change that much from day to day. Uh, okay. Now, if you're going the 1st of October or the 1st of September, it will definitely change in a month's time. Um, but you can see that happen on this program. So then you get to see exactly the time of sunrise, the direction of the sunrise, and then you can also scroll a little tool and see what angle of the sun is, happens as the day progresses. Wow, that's cool. So you know if you have, you know, even if you have a large bank of trees or a hill over here and you have to have the sun up a certain angle, you can see some of that ahead of time. And some this of the is issues. The photographer's ephemeris. Photographer's ephemeris. It's expensive for an app, T too. It's it like 15 bucks or something, I think. Because I, I bought it. I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, this looks complicated. <laughs> they have a free web based version. Okay. And uh, that's the one I I'm, use. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm way more comfortable on a computer than I am on the little phone. Oh, I'd recommend it. It's just that when you're out walking around and you wanted to check something, it's nice may to not have, have it your computer there. with you. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe if I learn how to use it, <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Yes. Hey, do you know other apps or other? Uh, you were just mentioning one earlier. The sun survey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had. N I've never tried that, but it sounds like that may be an similar, easier system. App, yeah. yeah. I just found this one, and it works for it's, me, well, so I have. It's by far the most popular one. The mm. photographer's ephemeris. Mm. <laughs> That's a new word for me too. That's, when I found out about it. <laughs> yes. Was for most of us. Okay, so you have 20 places chosen, yep. and you figure out what time you're going to go based on the what, lighting. What you see from the lighting. And, and uh, then what? Then you, uh, you just map. It's like doing a tour. I used to work in the music business, and it's just like mapping out a tour. You, you start at wherever you're flying into or wherever you think you want to fly into, and of course that's based on flight costs and car rental costs. A car rental in Milan is, uh, the last thing I checked, was over $1,000 more than a car rental in Nice, which is really? 300 miles away. So if you don't mind driving an extra 300 miles, you can save $1,000. Uh, 
Um, well, what, so what would you do? Take a train to the cheap? How, how did you find I would, that out? I would then fly into Nice and uh, well, well, get a rental car there. Well, for me, I'm flying into Rome because that's where I'm staying. If you've already established where you're flying to, yeah. And so how would I find the cheapest car rental place? Uh, you, I would use Auto Europe. Auto Europe? It's an American company. Okay. And they rent in Europe, as it sounds. And they, it's, it's just a database very much like Expedia. They'll check all the different vendors. Oh. And um, one of the more popular ones is uh, Europe Car. Europe Car. And it's normally the cheapest. Okay. And they have rental cars at every train stop, uh, every, all over town. Uh, it's amazing how many cars they have. Largely because so many Europeans don't have anywhere near as many cars as we do. Okay. They normally take public transportation. And if they want to rent a car, they need some available. So there's more easier rentals available okay. in Europe than there are here in the States. Yeah, because you said you thought I should rent a car at least part of the time, right? I really do. You really need and one. i got to drive a little teensy-eensy car, right? It'll be a small car. Like big cars. <laughs> It'll be a small car. You won't like the $6 a gallon price on fuel. Oh, that's fuel. Right. The gas is mm -hmm. crazy, too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the but you don't think uh, getting because uh, my my plan was getting around by train, and you think that's going to limit me too much? Absolutely. As a photographer, you would just go nuts. Okay. You really would. I think trains are really efficient in most places. Uh, Tren Italia is not my favorite. Uh, you'll come up with some interesting smells that you never thought existed. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is fairly efficient, and if you want, if you're flying to Rome and you need to get to Florence, take a train. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay. But if you're going to be in the back hills of Umbria uh, with your camera and you want to get from here to here at, at sunrise, you've got to have got to have a car. Yeah, and it's nice to keep extra stuff in the car, right. like an extra jacket if you may need it, or you know that kind of stuff. So you're Cooler not cooler with water. Yes. Or, yeah. Just extra supplies. I mean, you know, I have a minivan here, the Understand Photography minivan, you and I won't have a minivan is, there. That thing is jam packed. I got a card in there for carrying gear on the beach. I've got tripods. You really use that sucker. Reflectors, and uh -huh. I just keep it all in the car. Yeah. I've got sweaters because in Florida, you, as you know, when you go inside, you need a sweater. Yes. Outside it's hot, inside it's freezing. Yes, <laughs> you do. But My, yeah, that is good advice though, because then you, plus then you're not lugging all that heavy equipment all the time too. Mm -hmm. How expensive though? Is it really expensive to rent a car? No. It's not no, too bad? It, it's really not bad. Uh, you will end up with a smaller car than you thought you would. Yeah, it's um, going to be a little... But uh, it's, you can squeeze in. <laughs> you really can. Don't pack so much. Uh, we tend to bring too much stuff with us when we go. Most of the stuff I pack is camera gear. And uh, some, I use dry fit materials. It's a Nike brand, but it's... Uh, dry fit? Dry fit. It, it's uh, t-shirts, underwear, socks, and you can wash them out and they'll be dry in about an hour. Oh. Uh, it's really convenient. That way you're not having to pack all kinds of stuff. First time we went to Cuba, okay, so living in Florida, I'm used to the hot, mm -hmm. and, but I'm also used to trying to hide from the sun because it's so bad for you, too much of it. So I have all these white, lightweight cotton shirts with that sleeves? I wear with sleeves, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in Cuba, you know, they're so poor. And even though we were staying in a nice hotel, the air conditioning's different. It's very it was clammy in there, you know? And that, my little shirt that if I wore it outside, it would dry in five minutes. It never dried inside the <laughs> Not room. quite dry. <laughs> yes. Oh, but you know, that's Cuba. You have, to, you have to go to Cuba with an open mind. <laughs> yes, you do. And you will find that air conditioning in, in Europe generally is not quite on par with American air conditioning. It was so funny, it wasn't even anything. Okay, I'm meeting a friend of mine who lives in the Philippines, right? So we're gonna meet in Italy. Mm. And uh, I was talking to her on the phone, which I didn't even know. I learned from her that Facebook Messenger, you can make free phone calls over. So she called me on my cell phone. I'm like, I never even gave you my cell phone number. How'd you get my cell phone number? Very she called good me to on know. Messenger. Anyway, yeah. um, she's, she's reading the you know, place we're staying. She's, oh good, they have air conditioning which never even occurred to me to ask. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rare, especially in the uh, country, uh, in the countryside. Well, in she's town, been there before, in town so there's she... more of it, but yeah, it's, yeah, it is rare. And here's this, you might check this. Um, if you're going over in May or June, uh -huh. they may not even have it turned on yet. 
Oh yeah. Because well, they've I determined. Told you when I went to Paris in June, it was cold. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Italy's not that much farther south. No, and especially in Umbria with the mountains, I would have a jacket uh, and a scarf always ready, just at a notice. Even when I go in August. Well. Probably not. <laughs> be, it should be warm enough for you. But yeah, air conditioning, it does take you by surprise. Actually, and if, I just realized we're going to be airing this while I'm in Italy. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Peggy is now in Italy. I'm in Italy. Not right now, but I will uh, be by the time you watch this. <laughs> shortly. Yeah. All right, so what else? So that's a, that is a concern. Okay. So for it. Just bring everything, basically. Be aware of it. Bring everything, but pack lightly. <laughs> <laughs> pack lightly. Definitely need a backpack for your camera and gear. Okay. Uh, I just got a new one that is hard for uh, thieves. That's nice. That, you know, the zipper like tucks in. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Hide it under a flap. Those are, yeah. Those are yeah. good. Yeah. Yep. But uh, I, a lot of photographers I see sometimes, casual photographers will have like side bags and things like that, but that's pretty rough on your neck and shoulders if yeah. you've got much weight. So yeah. definitely a backpack. And um, bring your tripod. Bring that tripod everywhere. This is, you know, that's one of the hardest things for me who started off as a portrait photographer and I never used a tripod and I'm, I'm getting better, but it's heavy. Even with the carbon legs, it's still heavy. A light one doesn't do you much good. In fact, I, I've said this before, a cheap light tripod can do more damage than good. You said it to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's frustrating because you spend more time monkeying with it for one thing yeah. and then you trust it and you can't trust it. Yeah, it, so fails. it fails you. So what, what it's, about gear? It's when the most you're planning important. your photo trips, do you think about the gear as you're planning it? Or Absolutely. Because you're bringing, you're bringing people who pay you. Well, for workshops, uh, I have kind of a skeleton amount of, of things that I need to show them the process okay. and, and that I go through. I don't necessarily have everything out with me all the time. But since this is my livelihood, if I'm doing a two or three month trip over to Central Europe, I'm bringing everything I have. Okay. Um, what about for those of us who are, who are not, I mean, my pictures, uh, you know, who knows what I'll do with them, but mm -hmm. I don't have a plan for the pictures. I'm not really selling fine art photography like you are. I'm just going to do it because I want the beautiful pictures, but I don't want to carry everything I own with me. Right. I don't and want my back to be broken no, by the no. time I'm home, you know? And you don't need to have that all the time. You know, you've got some great lenses. The Canon system, the 2470 that we've talked about, can do, that's my workhorse. Uh, I do probably most of my photos with that single lens. But besides the gear, what else can we think about? Like, what else do you need? Do you need, uh, well, because we talked about a rain. Clothes. Always have rain gear available. Um, and by rain, rain gear. Because it happens, some kind of a rain jacket and a rain hat. And for uh, your gear, just a plastic bag, pla right? You I use a plastic a, bag. Yeah, you don't need a fancy. No, and they take up no space at all. You can stick them in the corner of your backpack and they cost nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, you can buy some pretty expensive uh, waterproof housings and, I know. and rain housings. Um, I actually have the one for my uh, my uh, iPhone. Mm -hmm. I had to get because I got the big iPhone and it's in a case. So you've got a massive. So it took me about phone. three tries to get. Do you have it around one. your neck and. I put it when I'm when I'm swamp walking. I put it around my. Oh yeah. Yeah, because I can't get to my gear because I got a dry bag. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking cell phone pictures. <laughs> I mean, we eventually get to the gear, but. Yeah. So okay, so what about like you you wrote down in your notes backup system? What do you mean by that? Uh, well, again, it, it, it totally I mean, comes down to, to what the purpose of you being there is, yeah. And for me, I always have a backup body and uh, normally have lenses that can double. If I've, I've had lenses go out. I've never had a, a body crash, but... Um, oh, see, that, I had the opposite. Well, I did have a body f get blown off my tripod one time. It didn't get blown off. The tripod got blown over and... Crash. Crashed oh, on concrete. Man, that's painful. Yeah, it was very painful. Oh. It was a nice lens and oh, everything. So geez. I've had that happen. Um, but as far as breaking down the gear, is, my experience has been pretty trustworthy. Yeah. Um, but still, you have to have some kind of backup. You've got to have a backup. Even if it's a point and shoot, right? Yes. Or a bridge camera. And even if you're only there for vacation and the photos are going to mean nothing but your own you personal memory, yeah. yes, you don't want to. And the iPhone, the sensor on the iPhone is so small that those pictures are not going to be any good. 
unless you, you know, you might be able to print them as a four by six. I was going to say, when viewed like that at a four by six, they, they do a... They look so good on the computer because yeah. the computer is, what, 72 dots per inch or something where right. you don't need a high resolution, but if you want to print them... If you want to print for your wall or something larger, you're going to want to... Or even a book. You, well, yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, a book's not big, but you're going to need, you know, eight and a half by 11 or something size, mm -hmm. so... Even a bridge, like I've got my little Lumix, my Panasonic Lumix mm -hmm. is my backup. It's a yeah. bridge camera. It's yep. a small camera. Mm -hmm. so I would recommend that. Uh, Fuji has a nice system, and Sony has Sony's, nice the ones. Sony's are real, all the rage right mm, now. <laughs> real, real popular. Yep. All right. So, uh, yeah, just, and batteries. Don't make buy, sure buy you have Buy extra a, batteries. Yeah. Right? And when you're going to need a converter in different places you go. Most things you buy nowadays are dual voltage. What does so, that mean? Which means they operate on both 110 and 220. Um, but you still need an you need adapter an adapter to plug, plug mm -hmm. it in, yep. right? Mm -hmm. But you won't blow it up if you plug it in, right? But, okay. So it doesn't uh, need you don't need to convert okay. the power. You just need to adapt to their outlets. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you're s go ahead and, and talk about so you're you've planned out these 20 places, and, and you know what time of day you're going to be there. You know what gear you're bringing. What's next? What's next is uh, get the ball rolling. You know, you're flying into the, the last trip that my wife and I took. Well, we flew to Venice, and I was I knew that I was going to start in the Dolomite Mountains, which is about a two-hour drive. Is it north of Venice? So it's northwest. Okay. Mm -hmm. A real simple drive. So that's where I knew I was starting. We knew we were going to be there for about almost three months, and the only thing that we had booked was I had all my roughly 20 spots picked out, but the only thing we had booked was the rental car, the flights, and the first three nights Where'd you, Did you stay in room. Venice? Or? I drove immediately from Venice up to uh, uh, Cortona, Cortina, Don Penzo. Cortona's in uh, Tuscany. Oh. <laughs> um, and so I just had the first three nights booked. And that's how we operate because uh, if I get the shots I'm after, then we move on, oh, and do you not use until we do. Hotels or Airbnb, or Airbnb, bed and breakfasts, is there any? pretty much anything. Okay. Uh, and that's the apartment my lovely wife. She's she, in charge of that. And she reads the weather charts just voraciously. Ah. It's, it's so funny. <laughs> she knows exactly, and uh, it's been really, really helpful. And then she normally books all the uh, rooms for us wherever they are. And is it, now what's the busy season in, in Europe in the summer, right? Summer. Uh, but you're, and you're there in the summer, right, usually? Not this, not right now, but usually you're there in the summer, A right? traditional year for us would be Europe in the spring for okay. at least a couple months, and then normally go over to, like, England or somewhere that's out of the Schengen. Is that a, a term familiar to? Not to me. Uh, the EU have all, all the countries have signed an agreement called the Schengen Agreement, which allows people, once you get into one of the countries, to travel across the borders without a visa. Ah. But it puts limitations on how long you can be there. And for the Americans, the standard limitation is 90 days. Right, Can't I did stay know longer that. than that. I looked it up. Okay. So then we go to the UK, which does not have that agreement. And if we're there for 90 days, then we can go back to the EU. Oh, wow. And, uh, so you get so 90 days in, in the UK and then 90 days in the Schengen. Schengen countries. Schengen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I looked it up because I, 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 I think, I've, of course, I've told you, but I'll tell the audience, I'm swapping houses with somebody in Italy. And they said they wanted to go for a month. Well, the last time I traveled for that long a period of time, well, I didn't go that long because I wanted to go for a month to the Philippines to see my friend, mm -hmm. and I, you can't go. Yeah, that would be a whole 21 different... 21 days, uh -huh. or 20, something like that anyway. And they may require a separate visa, too. I don't you, know. Yeah, if you get a visa, you can stay longer, but I didn't... Uh, the, getting the visa was not going to be as easy as just... But you can just go for 20, 21 days. So as a tourist, like you can that. just go visit for yeah. three weeks. Yeah. That's so kinda... I thought, I better look this up before I make any commitments to these people, you know? And, mm -hmm. and it was th 90 days. I was like, oh, cool. Honestly, <laughs> it's, it's really pretty good, because that's without a visa. You just show up and, awesome. and uh, show them your passport, and off you go. Um, and hopefully it'll stay that way for a while, um, because that's a convenient one. If you apply for a visa and get into their tax system as a as a business owner, things can get complicated. So I've always just kept it as a, a, a visitor, tourist type 
visa, and I'm not taking any jobs there. Uh, I'm not. Right. Yes, I'm collecting photos, and that's well. What you're I do. bringing people. You're bringing tourists into the area. I'm meeting them there. But so, I mean, they're, mm -hmm. meeting, they're coming because of you. The net result of what I'm doing is actually is money positive into their, money into right. their system. <laughs> yeah. But try convincing one of them. Yeah, that. I know, governments. Yeah. So governments are, yeah. So. All right, so how, okay, so you book your hotel for three nights, mm -hmm. and you say that you might leave early if you get what you need. How do you know what you, I mean, how do you set up the shoot? So uh, you know what time you're going to do it. Yeah, say in, the, in uh, Cortina, I actually had six or seven specific areas, locations I wanted to shoot, and I knew that it was going to be morning in one and night, evening in another, and I work mostly around sunrise and sunset okay. landscape stuff. It normally works best that way. Yeah. Um, and so I just kind of picked one uh, to start with. Uh, I drove up, and uh, there was one that intrigued me the most, and so I arrived at 3 in the afternoon, and I drove immediately to that one that I thought this was going to be my favorite spot, just to kind of get the lay of the land. And that's an important part of what I do is the whole scouting process. Okay. You can look on Google Earth till you're blue in the face, but until you actually get there on the side of the mountain and see exactly how the scene looks, um, you're not going to know for sure. Okay, so, so you go even though the lighting is terrible. Absolutely. You just want to go see it before you photograph it. It's so important. Okay. And so my typical day would then be get up before sunrise, uh -huh. go to my spot, wait for the sun to happen, and this is a spot I've already scouted probably the day before, uh, shoot that, and then any other in that area that I've also thought I would like to capture. And how long, how long do you stay out usually? Uh, it totally depends on the light oh, okay. and what it gives you. Uh, sometimes later in the season, when the sun stays low on the lower on the horizon, you can shoot a lot longer in okay. the morning and start shooting earlier in the evening and still get those so, cool at least angles. A couple hours. Normally, it's a couple hours okay. at least, yeah. And uh, and then I'm I'm done. Pack it up. If there's anything else in the area I want to see, I'll go look at it. But then I'll go back probably eat breakfast at that point, and then. Uh, start looking at what's next and what's next for that day is typically a scouting session okay. uh, If I haven't seen what I'm shooting that night Yet I will go take a look at it if I've already scouted that then I will go look at what's happening tomorrow morning So you do that every day pretty and that's pretty much the, about your wife? the routine uh, She's either with me or has some of her own things that she wants well, to do she works she can but work anywhere, right? Yes, she owns a business that allows her to work. So sometimes off. she'll stay back at the hotel and work while you're. Quite often, she's right back. Yeah, she sleeps in. She's. I would too if I were her. <laughs> well, that's so funny, and I always I, I tell this story. The face on some of my workshop students when I hand them the itinerary and say, "All right, we're going to meet tomorrow morning at three thirty, in the morning." Three thirty. And they they all about pass out. Um, you don't warn them ahead of time? <laughs> uh, I think they know what they're getting into. Uh, because uh, sometimes there's a bit of a drive, there's normally a little bit of a hike, and then you don't want to be just setting up your gear at the decisive the moment and miss the whole thing. Yeah, wow. uh, That happens a lot. Where, And that's why it's good. I encourage my students to know everything about their cameras in the dark by feel, know exactly which button does what by how it feels. Now, do you... Um, do you your students are, are they like the people here where everybody kind of shoots in some automatic mode and or are they more advanced or you get a little bit of both I suppose because um, I know for me as you know one of my little peeves is that all the internet teachers say learn to shoot an aperture priority and I am not opposed to aperture priority but I think you need to learn to shoot in the manual mode so you know what you're doing oh absolutely I would suggest learn I would learn all the modes, yeah. uh, manual, shutter, and aperture, just so you know what they right. do. Um, I'm very comfortable in manual. I don't use it as much as I probably use aperture. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Um, if I was a sports photographer, I'd use manual, uh -huh. probably all the time. Uh, I think if I was a studio photographer, I'd use manual you all have, the time. You have to, yeah. <laughs> okay. in the studio, yeah. you have a choice. Ev event <laughs> photography, manual. Yeah. Um, so there's an awful lot of places that I feel like it's required. That's just what you do. Uh, a good share of what I do out in the landscape world, first of all, the most important question is, is depth of field, I think, in a landscape photo. And that's an aperture question. Right. And so you get that where you want it, 
And oftentimes you don't really care what the shutter speed is. Right, because you're on a tripod. You've got a shutter release cable. Yes, and and uh, there are times where you really do care about the shutter speed, and so then you work with it. But what the real reason that I use aperture is because I'm shooting at sunrise or sunset when the lighting is changing so fast mm. that I let the camera chase that lighting difference as opposed to me making so adjustments every time. So is that what you recommend time. with your students when they're or it depends on the if student. we're if we're up on the side of a hill doing exactly kind of what I've been describing, I would say here's how I would do it, and I would recommend it. Some of them like shooting in manual and would prefer it. I'll never say don't, right? Um, because if that's a, a comfortable mode for them, then right. Absolutely. Well, like for me, I'm more comfortable in manual than any other mode. But I know because I have the same students that you have mm -hmm. that most people are not learning that, and so you have to you have to make sure that they're going to get good pictures and aperture priority as long as you're on a tripod with a shutter release cable is a very good mode. Of course, yeah. I'm, the main problem I have with aperture priority is, is that they're not learning what they're doing and then they're wondering why they get blurry pictures because they're not understanding the relationship that their shutter speed is slowing down so much. That's, and they're not on a, that's what you need to watch on a tripod, out for. You know? But if landscape photography you're always going to be on a tripod, right? I would, oh, 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. I would never recommend aperture as an easier alternative to manual. Right. I'm not saying this is no, a good I shortcut. That you're not, you're not I, saying that. I yeah. don't think, I don't believe in that. Uh, I think in some cases it's actually a better way to do it. So, yeah. But no, you, it makes perfect sense. But here's another scenario. I do a lot of panoramics where they're multi shot panoramics. That has to be shot in manual. And how um, do you do your panos? You You've got your tripod. Yeah, what you, about you have your to gear level it. Tripod. Do you do it with your gearhead tripod? Absolutely. You are like a fanatic about your gearhead. I love my gearhead <laughs> tripod. I would be dead without it. No, it's it's uh, made my life a lot easier. And is it easier to do a, a panoramic with that? Um, it certainly isn't harder. Okay. Um, as you know, a gearhead is so easy to make minute adjustments with. That's really the uh, the reason for it. And, okay. Um, and either way, I've never used a gearhead tripod. So, but it, either way, yep. you can pan sideways the, the or main up and thing, down or anything. The main thing is to level your tripod. Okay. And then I use a uh, a little spirit level on top of my camera. I have an electronic level in the camera, but it's easier for me to use this little. Those little like that little yep. ball, that little square thing. There. Yeah, just I've like seen a, a lot of like people Like a with carpenter's that. level. It's yeah. just a, 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 a and little. And does it go in your hot shoe or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yep, I've slides seen right those. In. Yeah, those mm -hmm. are cool. And it's just a quick way to, to keep it level. But the first thing you have to level is your tripod. Okay. And get it level. And then you level your camera on the tripod. Okay. Because otherwise when you, you do a pan left and right, if your tripod's crooked, your camera's going to go from level to crooked. Yeah. So uh, the whole platform has to be level. So level your tripod, then level put your, your camera tripod. on there. Put your level camera your... on there. Level the camera. And then just double check, swing it the whole width sure of your... Make sure it's not too tight mm -hmm. one before you start, yeah. right? Yeah. And I normally... And how much do you overlap when you do a pan? About a third. <coughs> so you'll take the first picture to the left, mm -hmm. and then you'll overlap a third for the second picture, yep. overlap a third, overlap however many pictures My focus take. point is in the center, typically, so I will just use that as a reference and I'll know where the edge of my previous shot was, so I'll just take that center point just a little past where I was and, and do you work focus my way around. And do you focus automatically or each shot? Uh, no, I'll normally focus ahead of time. I use back button focus. And, and you focus on this, okay, so on the middle picture you focus. Right? Normally when you're doing a panoramic, start. it's it's out, everything is out in front of you a ways. Okay. Um, so I'll focus on whatever the subject is, or sometimes a little this side of it if I'm thinking uh, depth of field. Okay. Uh, but um, the hyperfocal distance is something that would be good for most landscape guys to get a handle on. Now a rule of thumb for that, if we don't want to do any math, is what? One the old rule of thumb was, one third was of the a way. third of the way in, yeah. So if your your thing is, your your subject is 90 yards away, you would focus at 30 yards? Uh, well actually it's typically it's it's a third of the way up your frame, oh. is, what, is what they're talking about. Oh. 
okay. So as opposed to uh, ah, actually CMI measuring it out. Geez. Okay. But, well, that's uh, good to know. And it's good to know your uh, depth of field differences in your apertures. I have a little, I used to carry around a piece of paper that had my chart, but there's so many little apps that do that for you on the phone. Do you know what they um, do any, any of them? I don't have the name okay. of mine with me, but you can find them all over the place. Okay. Depth, depth of field calculator is what you're looking for. Okay. And, we'll we'll uh, have that in the show notes. We'll do that. Uh, so back to the panoramic. I typically shoot panoramics on the vertical orientation ah, of my camera. Okay. Uh, that way you can use a bit more zoom in, make it a little longer lens, and uh, you end up with a gigantic file size. Oh, I can't even imagine how big. I'm like 50 megabit more than that. Some of them are in the neighborhood of one to two gigabytes. Wow. That I've been doing. I'm shooting with the the uh, 5D SR, which oh, is a oh. 50 megapixel camera. Anyway, so if you're doing nine across, uh, that's a bunch, and then <coughs> so that's uh, well 450 megabytes for the wow. raw, and you convert that to TIFF, and it's suddenly so now you Gigantic. have a pretty super computer then. Uh, For your laptop, obviously, yeah. if you're traveling. I, I use a laptop when I travel, um, mostly as a backup device. I don't use it to process much. But I will import all my photos into Lightroom on it. Mm -hmm. So you do that while but, you're there? Yes. You back your, your pictures up onto your laptop or onto a hard drive? Absolutely. In fact, I, I was going to touch on this, but okay. you brought it up. I, I'm a real stickler for backups. When yeah, because you took a trip to Europe. <laughs> when it comes, and, and everybody should, should do a little bit of this. Backup batteries, uh, you know, have plenty on hand, plenty of cards. I have a rule. I'll never reuse a card on a single trip. That's oh, just that's my rule. Because I want to come back with all of my originals still on the same card. At that point, it's a backup because I also have it on a hard drive somewhere. <laughs> so you have two backups, basically, yes. the card and the... Hard drive. And I even go further than that. You're going to think I'm crazy, but the 5D has a SD card and a CF card. I take pictures to both simultaneously. So you have two cards and two the, cards and a hard awesome. drive. But again, <coughs> it, it depends on the purpose of your trip. I, I, the thought of losing images after some, the amount of work that goes into mm. some of them just mm. kills me. So uh, I make sure. That's awesome. That's, that's really good advice because most people are so lazy about backup, you know? Well, and the whole idea of deleting uh, photos on the spot, uh, unless it's something we were talking in a, a previous uh, episode about Paris and panning where you may end up with 40 shots of the same mm -hmm. thing. That's probably the only place where I'll actually delete photos off my camera. Um, most of the time, Everything I take goes on to my hard yeah, drive. Yeah, me too. You in fact, just I have, don't know. As you know, I have an event photography business locally, and I hire other photographers. And mm -hmm. there was one gal, that we were working a wedding together, and she was assisting me. And I, I'm like, let me see your pictures, right? Because I want to make sure my assistant's getting pictures that I need. And, and I said, you've taken so few pictures. She says, oh, I'm deleting as I go. Ooh. And I said, I want two shots of every couple, because she was doing the the we call it grip and grin shots of, let me get your picture, you know, all the couples. And she said, well, I was choosing the best one. I'm like, how do you know it's not blurry? You don't know by the back of that little camera screen. I want them all, you know? Yeah. Don't delete as you go. Because <laughs> no. you can't see that. It's only 72 dots per inch or something. It's very and low it's quality only a picture. few inches. That's yeah. my thing about aperture priority. This is what, is, it's not as bad now, but when I first started teaching, there was no such thing as I, auto ISO. Hmm. So what was happening is everybody was coming in, they were learning from other teachers to shoot an aperture priority rather than learning to shoot in the manual, and all their pictures were blurry, and they didn't understand why. And they, it was, they were blurry because the shutter speed was going too slow, but you couldn't see the blur on the back of the camera because huh. that screen is very low resolution. Yep. All right, let me get off my soapbox and get back to you. No, <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. And when it comes to checking images, you can scroll in and zoom in onto your image. Right. And if you're l gonna check and need to see if it's blurry or not, you, that's the only way to do it. Because right. if you leave it at But a, if she's sitting there deleting it, you know she's not going through all that. No. It's I, so much faster to do it in Lightroom later. That sounds so scary to me. Yeah, I was flipped out when I saw her. I mean, she was the assistant, so it wasn't like I needed, needed those pictures, but still. Yeah. 
So anyway, that's, I, you live, you learn. In uh, my typical situation, like on the side of a hill, I will use, uh, I focus quite often with my live view. Mm. Uh, with the Canon system, you can zoom in to 10x, I believe, something like that. And with the camera I'm using, you can get in really, really tight and just double check the focus. Uh, sometimes it's the autofocus is off by a hair, but uh, always verify the focus before I start shooting. That's really good advice, and, too, uh, which I, I, you know, I went and did night photography for my first time a month or so ago, and that's what we were doing. We were shining a f flashlight on mm -hmm. and then using live view and zooming in because mm -hmm. it was really hard to see what you were doing in night photography. Absolutely. That's a prime example of exactly how you would use it, yeah. And then you can always go back in uh, and then zoom in on the shot you just took and just take to make a peek. Sure it's but just bear in mind that the image you're looking at is a JPEG. Oh. It's not the raw. It's going to be whatever the camera created in the style that it, you've asked it to create. Okay. So it's going to be a little bit rougher than the actual raw will be. So when you zoom in all the way to check your focus, it's not going to be, and you go, oh, that's not very sharp. Well, the end product will probably be, be a little, little bit sharper. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so during your shoot, yes, get there early. Yes. Bring a snack. Bring a snack. <laughs> and water. Yes. Know where the bathroom is or bring toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, if you're out in the mountains, hopefully you've done that before. Huh? Guys have a little easier time of oh, that, I probably. Know. It's tough being a woman. <laughs> um, but, yep, uh, snack is important. Yeah, sometimes you're waiting. You got there a lot faster than you thought you would. You made it to the side of the hill, and you're just sitting there. And sometimes and it's so freezing cold. And so when you say cold. you're just waiting, what are you waiting for? I spend half my life waiting for the light. Just you, you wait, and you see the light coming up, and it's just not perfect yet? Is that? Well, hopefully on your scouting trip, you, go, you realize where the, the sunrise is coming from. Right, so that and, you're in the right position. Yep, yeah, and then you know, and you've got to pre-visualize is what we call it. Uh, what the scene will look like once the sun has started to light it. And based on whether the sun is near your shoulder or kind of further away around, you can determine, uh, and this is partly experience, it's just partly using angles that you see, uh, what parts of the, either the buildings, if you're shooting a town on the side of a hill, or what part of your scene will be lit. But that's all part of pre-visualizing, and that happens when you're out scouting, hopefully yeah. the day before. And so sometimes, and do you have to move yourself because you absolutely. got in the wrong spot? Absolutely. You, thought you, were you got it wrong. Or you have to go to plan B. Or uh, it just didn't come quite alive here, but you know over down that way there was a, another option for you. So you, you And that's, that may be one of the hardest decisions I make on a daily basis is, is when do you move? Uh, when have you gotten the shot you want? Or is it going to happen? Okay. And uh, answering those questions, there's no easy way. So you just kind of like, I think I got it, but... Well... Or sometimes I know for me, I don't really think I got the shot, but I don't know what else to do. Yep. Well... That's, once, that's when it's nice to have a photo buddy with you. Yeah, it is. And you can because talk about can it. Because they can kind of... I'm like, I know I'm not getting what mm -hmm. I want. I just don't, you know? Yep. For me, in a lot of the shots I'm doing, I have an idea of what it is I want. And if it comes together and looks like the way I wanted it, I feel satisfied. Okay. And if there's something keeping it from being as good as I thought it could be, whether it's the clouds or the angle I missed or, or something didn't happen right, then I either go back the next day and do it until it happens right, uh, or we say, all right, enough is enough, and we move on. But I've gone back to the same place three or four times, three or four days in a row. Um, so when you, okay, so you, so let's just summarize. Okay, so you, when you're scouting out a trip, first you're going on the internet to decide where to go. Pinterest, travel guides, things like that. Yeah, using whatever, so even movies. Watching oh, a movie yeah. and you see a, you see a grand vista and you go, wow, where the heck is that? And then you I'll do a little you research. I'll tell what, I got a problem because I look everything up on my phone. I can't even watch TV anymore. Oh, let me see what that is. Oh, where is it? I've seen that actor before. Let me look at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the phone these days has become a real a a good resource. Yeah, so whatever place you use to get that kind of information, whether so you, you like looking through. you where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. 
and then you plan it out by the route. Mm -hmm. Route it just like it makes sense, like you would if you're, All right, you're not running errands go around north town. And south, yeah. You're going to go north mm -hmm. or the circle or whatever. The complicating factor is the weather, and that's where my weather, yeah. my weatherman wife, who is fabulous with that, knows the, what the storm is going to be doing and where it's coming from. And and so then you take you may not do that until you get there, though, right? Yeah, because it's changing all the yeah. time. Yeah, and we've you know we've been in the middle of Switzerland, hoping to get into Germany to finish off the run up there, but the weather is just ridiculous, and we end up down in, in Italy. Oh. Um, it just, yeah, you have to be, and that's why we don't book the whole trip. That's so that smart. Would, it, well, it, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah. And that would be the most frustrating for me, is if I had a, a week or two weeks, it was all booked, all planned out, and I had to be in these cities on those specific days. Because oh, and then the light was bad, yeah. or the weather was bad. Yeah, oh, it happens. Yeah. So that would be frustrating. Okay, so, so we keep it open. So you're so then you get there, you go to your first spot mm -hmm. at three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. Scout, you scout it, out. it out. Yep. And then you go back that night or the next morning. Mm -hmm. And then you do the same thing every day. A lot of repeat, yes. And then Hopefully the by the end of the eighth. When you get home. You don't do it. I don't normally do them on the road. Uh, if I had a laptop that I totally trusted the screen, I might do some of it. But laptops, every time um, you move them, the screen changes. It does, and uh, I... And you're traveling, so you can't lug around a big desktop. <laughs> no, and even a calibrated <laughs> screen on a laptop is just not, not a good way to work. So I will, I will normally copy everything, and I use Lightroom, so I copy everything and catalog it in Lightroom, and then... Uh, I may do some tweaks with it, or I may start doing keywords, and uh, which oh, okay. is an important part of the process. Okay. Uh, I may and you just transfer sort. the whole catalog over to your desktop when mm -hmm. you get back. Okay. Yeah. Or actually, in my case, I, I actually carry my master catalog with me. Oh, on a portable hard on drive? On a portable hard drive. Oh, and I have a backup a good idea drive too. with me as well. So oh. when I get home, all it is is just plugging the drive into the other computer. That's a good idea. I should do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not that good with Lightroom. In fact, I'm going to pitch Joe's Lightroom <laughs> class right now because I have been using Lightroom for a long time, and I still struggle with it. But Joe just came out with an online Lightroom class, and it's 29 short videos. And I, I kind of skimmed it when he finished it, mm -hmm. but now I'm kind of going through it. And the catalog is... Catalog and the collections, that's the hard part for me. So I'm hmm. starting to kind of get it now. But I want to yeah. be able to do that when I'm in Italy for a whole month. I don't want to work on my pictures while I'm there. I want to take pictures. Right, right. You want to be out, work on you them, be out you know? shooting. Yeah. yeah. No, Lightroom so. is a fabulous piece of software. I used to use Photoshop quite a bit just to finish off the photos. I rare, well, I shouldn't say rarely. I don't use a lot of Photoshop anymore. Most of my processing is done yeah, in Lightroom. Yeah, Lightroom's, and that class Joe put out is amazing. Yeah. So what's, now what's coming up, what's the most, the next thing coming up for Brian Jansen? Well, uh, I have got a, a month or so in Paris. I do the night, Ooh. the night workshops, the night and photography. What, when is September that? and October. It's going to, oh. like the half of September into half of and October. And we're in 2017, in case you watch this later. 2017. So you have a, um, a three-day it's called Three Nights in Paris. Three Nights in Paris. You can't do it in one night, so uh, it's three consecutive nights, and it's all about night photography. It happens just before sunset, and we go through the twilight, and uh, we go to three specific locations, and uh, we have a good time. Oh, wow. I wish I could go. Oh. And then we all go out for patisserie, desserts, wine afterwards. We have Sounds a good time. Sounds fun, too. It is a good time. <laughs> yes. Now, you also do private lessons and private tours when you're in Paris, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. During the, those are typically daytime, either early morning or late afternoon. And how would people find you? Uh, that's on my website also. Which is? Uh, BrianJansen.com. And how do you spell that? Brian with an I, and Jansen is J-A-N-N-S-E-N. Dot -N -N -E com. And we're going to put the all of the notes from today's show and Brian's contact information and information on his Paris workshops on um, understandphotography.com. So be sure to check out the show notes. We also repurpose this. We're, we, we're Facebook and then we're on YouTube. And we also are a podcast on iTunes. We would really, really be grateful if you gave us a review either on YouTube or iTunes. And please subscribe to our show on YouTube or iTunes, whichever you prefer. For me, I'm a kind of a driving in the car, listening to podcast person, but a lot of people like mm. to watch the actual video as yeah. well. So thank you for coming. 
Thank you for having me. And I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. We will see you Friday on Facebook at 4 p.m. Eastern Time next week.